G'day, remember me? Dylan O'Donnell from the Byron Bay Observatory here. I've been in COVID lockdown because people are far too incompetent to stay still for seven days. And my government is far too incompetent to make them stay still for seven days or to convince them or even give them free medicine to stop this from happening in the first place. Lately, I've been demoted to school teacher. So I've been doing that instead of what I actually enjoy doing, which is making money for my family by actually going to work. But we're over that now, so here I am. Now, if you've been following my journey over the last few years, you know that I am a below average photographer. And lately, I've crept up from below average to slightly below average. This improvement is not down to a single single part or single process or single thing, but it's a culmination of really six main things that I've been focusing on over the last six months. Six things that I'll share with you in this video to improve your photography by a whopping 1%. I'll share with you these six tips after my obnoxiously loud intro, which goes for 19.7 seconds too long. My name is Dylan O'Donnell and you're watching Star Stuff. Why do we do it? Taking photos of space with relatively expensive equipment, obsessing over pixels, shooting the same things over and over. Sometimes I feel like Sisyphus, rolling a boulder up the mountain, only to do it over and over again. And then getting to the top of the mountain and realizing that there are a lot of other people here who got here before you anyway. It's pointless, completely and utterly pointless. Today's show is brought to you by High Point Scientific. High Point Scientific will help you with your astrophotography journey so you can roll your boulder up your mountain. They have a price match guarantee and they fully support their equipment. So if you're looking at something somewhere else, approach them and see if they can match that price. And also they have no incentive to push a particular brand. They just have a huge range and selection of stuff. So they'll help you get to where you wanna go with your astrophotography journey. Links in the description below. And full disclosure, if you buy anything from High Point Scientific using those links below, I get a bit of a kickback and I love money. So please do that. Welcome to the wonderful world of astrophotography. We're improving your processes over years and years of learning and obsessing over small pixels will improve the performance of your images by just a couple of pixels that no one will really notice because they're all looking at your images on fucking TikTok. I know what you're thinking. Tell me, Dylan, your secrets. I've seen your Instagram. I've scrolled all the way back through those years to your first embarrassing photos. And I know that you have slightly improved over the last seven years. <laughs> Tip number one is slow astrophotography. Over the years, I've been a fast astrophotographer. I've been using the Rasa at F2. I've been nailing targets basically in the same night. So that's where I would go out, take all my frames, all my image calibration is already preset, and I would knock over a target, sometimes two or three targets in a night. And that was very fulfilling, especially for getting images out to Instagram quickly. However, I've recently had a shift where I've been spending more time getting it right. Now this means doing the same target night after night again and again. And it also means taking more data. And I'll touch on this later. I don't mean just integrating more data. I mean getting the best data possible. I'll do it over maybe four nights and maybe I'll get HL for one night. Maybe I'll get red, green and blue the other nights. But even when I get a single channel in a night, I'll go back and check to see if the seeing was any good and I'll measure those images using subframe selector. And often I'll throw out a complete night of data because if one night is not as good as the next night, I'll just throw that first night data out completely. This is also very obvious when I'm doing something like planets. This year I took Jupiter over maybe four or five nights, just going again and again and again. And my process didn't change from night to night, but the atmosphere and the seeing certainly does. So the fifth night was actually the best one. And so I've got one great Jupiter image, one great Saturn image for the year. And so I'll really work hard and do it slowly to get the best image possible. And the same goes for deep space astrophotography as well. This for me is a huge mindset change. So I've gone from just whacking targets out of the sky, stamp collecting, if you will, to actually spending some time to get a target right. And if I get framing, focus or weather wrong at any particular time, I will go back and just do it again and again and again until I get it right.
Now, as a beginner astrophotographer, I definitely was guilty of ignoring my image calibration frames and particularly flats. Darks are pretty easy. You can set a master dark and reuse that master dark over and over again. Flats, however, are something that you really should be doing every single night or at least every single time you take an image run make sure you have the equivalent flat by using a light box or getting sky flats if you're using the rasa and then properly integrating those flats into your image calibration process i'll leave for you the settings that i use for flats here now when i'm using the rasa i have to take sky flats so there is a slight difference in the settings because you sometimes need to subtract stars from those sky flats however I've come up with a nifty little trick for my C11. I don't need a light box or a t-shirt or anything like that. I can just aim the C11 at the observatory roof because the observatory is closed. Just put on a small light in there, get the correct exposure so that it's not overexposed or underexposed. And then I can stack and integrate those flats and then apply them to my images. And it makes a huge difference. It is nice to know that if there are any dust motes on those images, I don't have to clean them up later. But I have to say, the main reason I use flats is not for dust motes, it's for vignetting. Not having to deal with that harsh, dark vignette around a frame really makes the difference to the final image. Tip number three is one that I've made a full video about this before and it's using less data, which sounds counterintuitive because I just told you to use more data. But in fact, what I'm trying to do is gather so much data that I can throw out sometimes more than half of the data and only integrate the best possible stuff. Even if your process is repeatable and predictable night after night, the atmosphere and the seeing is not. And there are so many variables in astrophotography that it just takes one of them to be subpar and that's your lowest common denominator, that's your bottleneck. So do as much data as you can and then throw out as much as you can to only use the best data for your images. It makes a huge difference to the final result. The process that you decide to use for star reduction shouldn't be understated. Star reduction can be done very well, not at all or very badly and doing star reduction well really improves the image a lot. It's something that you can notice even on images that have been downscaled for the web. Uh, when you see the stars reduced a bit and they're reduced well, it really makes the nebula or the deep space object much more prominent. And this is a truer reflection of reality because the stars aren't actually that big in the images. In fact, they're probably only one pixel at the most. It's just that the light blows out into all of those other surrounding pixels. So by reducing the stars well, you get a much better image. Now the star reduction method that I use these days is using Starnet++ in PixInsight to remove all of the stars. Then I subtract the layer so that I can have a completely separate star layer from my nebula layer. That allows me more power to then color correct the nebula itself and reduce those stars carefully and apply any processing or minimization to those stars without creating any ringing effects. And it also allows me to pull down any green in the stars as well, which we know is not a true color in space. So better star reduction in your images goes a long way. Point number five for my slight improvement in my astrophotography, particularly lately, is the upgrade to a 16-bit camera. And not just any 16-bit camera, the QHY268M. This is such a well-regarded camera and it really does show in my images. Stuff that I'm taking this year that's the same as the stuff that I took last year, it just looks better, it has a higher dynamic range. I can't say enough good things about it. It is the premier camera of the moment. Of course, there are other brands that do the same sort of chip. And I use the QHY268. Some people use the ZWO 6200. Same sensor, slightly different build quality, but this sensor is amazing and I highly recommend it if you can afford such a good camera. And if you're interested in making that leap to a monochrome, fast CMOS 16-bit camera, I'll leave the link down in the description below. And finally, the number one reason why my images have slightly improved in the last six months particularly is the mount. The Skywatcher EQ8RH Pro is 
probably overkill for what I need, but it is such a high precision and solid mount. It is something that has now become invisible to my process. I don't even think about the mount. It gets out of the way so that I can do what I need to do. I switch it on remotely, it does its thing. I haven't polar aligned the mount since 2020. It's now September of 2021 and I haven't needed to do anything. It, the target's always nearby, but I can plate solve in perfectly and I get sub arc second guiding the whole time. It's just something I don't think about anymore. And ever since I made the upgrade, my stars have been pinpoint round and perfect. So it's just a problem that I don't think about anymore. I don't know if it's just super popular or they didn't make enough of them before COVID struck and the supply chain issues crept into astrophotography in general. But if you can get your hands on one of these mounts or even something equivalent, I would thoroughly recommend investing that money in a mount that is so good, you don't even have to think about it. And now I'll just leave you with some of the images I've been taking lately. You've probably seen them on social media anyway. Uh, and there's a new one dropping today of the Helix Nebula, which I think turned out fantastic. Now for this Helix Nebula, I actually used 20 minute subs, uh, which is not something I do often, but I thought I'd see if I could get the outer detail of the Helix here, but not just away from it. You can see how it connects to the main structure. And there's even some really faint stuff that you can see on the edges there as well. So the total integration time of this image is quite massive and I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. It seems almost overexposed and that made it hard to make the color really pop in this one because the brightness of it leaches it out a bit but I don't mind that pastel effect and the aim for this particular image was to see more of that faint structure. Yeah, that's all I got today. I mean, even if the world is completely fucked, at least we can leave the planet and go do space stuff, hey? Thanks for taking me in your images and thanks for watching my video. I'll be back real soon. I hope you've been watching Star Stuff. My name is Dylan O'Donnell. Remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to die. Yeah.